This is the Food and Justice Podcast with Brenda Sanders. Hello, and thank you so much for joining me for Food and Justice. I'm Brenda Sanders, and I'm very excited about my guest today. I want to go ahead and just read her very impressive bio, and then we're going to jump into the questions. Dr. Christina M. Schiavone is Grassroots International Senior Communications Coordinator. A longtime food sovereignty activist, she was involved in the founding of the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance and the Food Sovereignty Prize and the establishment of the Civil Society and Indigenous Peoples Mechanism of the United Nations Committee on World Food Security. She has worked in partnership with social movements across the globe. She holds master's and PhD degrees from the International Institute of Social Studies in the Netherlands. Her research based in Venezuela focused on co-generation of knowledge by and for social movements. Passionate about the intersection of communications and movement building, she is excited to contribute to Grassroots International in this area. My goodness, thank you so, so, so much for taking the time to be on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Wow. I mean, like, this is a lot of really important work in the area of food sovereignty. And so I wanted to start off by asking you, um, just for folks who are new to the show and, and new to this topic, if you can explain the basic concept of food sovereignty. Sure. I think that's a great starting point. And I will start with the actual definition that social movements themselves have come up with. Okay. Um, this was at the Nialeni Forum of 2007 held in Mali with social movements around the world. And they say that food sovereignty is the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and their right to define their own food and agriculture systems. And if I had to boil this down to its essence, I would say that food sovereignty is really about transforming the food system to put power into the hands of the people. Mm. This concept originally came from the Via Campesina peasant movement during the rise of the World Trade Organization in the 1990s. This was because free trade was further impoverishing food producers, driving up hunger across the world. But today, many different movements are converging around food sovereignty, including feminist, indigenous, climate justice movements, just to name a few. I love that. I love the mm. fact that this is a topic that is finally getting its day in the sun. I mean, it, honestly, I am just talking to so many activists from so many different areas of activism who are all talking about food sovereignty, and it is about time. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. So what led you to care about and become involved in work for food sovereignty? Yeah, I'd say the connection to food started way back, I think, like for many of us. Um, Food was just a really important part of my community in the little Italy of Boston where I grew up. Uh, most of my neighbors were immigrant families who had made it through the Great Depression by sharing whatever food they had. And they carried on with these practices and imparted them to us. Uh, my neighbors were actually growing vegetables on their fire escape way before it was cool. Wow. And sharing them, yeah. Um, and by the time I was in high school, I realized that so many of the issues I cared about, animal rights, the environment, hunger, they all seemed to converge around food. So this led me to want to study food and agriculture in college. And as I did, I started off on a sort of more technical route, but really came to care about the politics of food and to feel like that was the area where I could maybe join with others to help make a contribution and it was actually a few years later when I was um, doing food organizing in New York City that I heard about food sovereignty actually from a farmer from Iowa, of all places, named George Naylor. Wow. But he was part of the National Family Farm Coalition, which is the U.S. member of La Via Campesina, hmm. the peasant movement. Um, so that's where I first heard about food sovereignty. And it just made so much sense to me. Um, and also the fact that it was at once this vision um, it was a movement, it was also a framework for action, and it was inspiring millions of people over the world. So it just seemed like, yeah, this is something uh, worth plugging into and trying to help advance. 
Hmm. It just clicked. I, I experienced something very, very similar when I found out about the food justice movement that mm -hmm. was uh, centered around um, low income urban communities. Mm -hmm. I was like, wait, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> I know about this. And I, you know, I, and it just it, it just made sense that I should be doing that work. So I can definitely relate. And, and there's something that you said uh, that reminded me, you know, marginalized communities just do these things and don't even necessarily know they're doing a thing, you know, like the folks who were growing uh, mm -hmm. food out on the fire escape. It, because I just recently, um, there's a woman who is actually um, houseless uh, just in uh, the community where I work. And um, and she just asked me if, if I could give her a ride. And so I wasn't in, involved in anything. I wasn't doing anything else. And so I said, yes. And it turned out that she wanted me to drive her around to all these different spots to give out water, to wow. give some people like some food that she had gotten from a food giveaway mm. elsewhere. Mm. And she was just going around and taking care of people who she knew needed water, who she knew needed food. Mm -hmm. And that was just like what we did. <laughs> yeah. And it, it it was it was just an amazing experience just to see that, you know, this this work this this woman is doing, she's taking care of other people. And it's not, you know, it doesn't have a label. It's just like mutual aid. It's just what absolutely. This is what's keeping people fed and surviving, you know, these kind of human to human, people to people interactions often from you know those who have the least but are doing the most uh, all absolutely. over the place absolutely so early in your career you ran a csa um for just food in manhattan's chelsea neighborhood can you tell us about the importance of csas and honestly can you just tell us what csas are <laughs> <laughs> and the importance to food sovereignty sure well csa stands for community supported agriculture and the idea came mainly as a way of supporting independent family farms, many of whom are struggling you know, in the US and all over the place. Um, and so the idea is essentially to buy a share in a future harvest upfront. So the farmers are getting money at a time when they really need it because for small scale farmers who aren't part of the industrial food system, it's really hard to access credit and other forms of support. So, um, and in doing so, community members are insured, um, you know, uh, regular distributions of healthy, sustainably produced food. But Just Food, which uh, was working on food justice in New York City, realized that CSA could also be an effective way of getting fresh food into urban communities that were most lacking it, um, because it requires relatively little infrastructure. Whereas with the farmer's market, you might need permitting and mm -hmm. all sorts of setup. With the CSA, you essentially just need a community distribution point, like at a community center or something. And so in Chelsea, we were at a community center that was based right in a public housing facility uh, there in Chelsea. And the thing about Chelsea is that it's a very uh, diverse, wide range of incomes. So we were able to create a mixed income CSA uh, that was sliding scale, it accepted food stamps, it had uh, a revolving loan fund, trying to pilot, you know, different ways of making it accessible to all sorts of people. Um, and at the same time, it was forming this long-term relationship with a wonderful family um, in upstate New York, a family farm, um, and getting really high quality organic food um, into the community. So, that was pretty much what we were working on. And in terms of how this connects to food sovereignty, I'd say it's one example of so many local alternative uh, community food projects happening all over the world. And these alone are not like the solution, but they are part of the solution together with public policy to make these sort of things um, accessible to society at large. Um, and as we're building these alternatives, we also have to be dismantling the predominant food system, right? So I would say CSA is, is a piece of that, especially CSAs that are working um, explicitly through a justice lens, like the ones that Just Food was promoting. 
Oh, yes. More of that. More mm-hmm. of that. And we do have some amazing uh, food justice folks uh, here in Baltimore who are doing food justice work. And CSAs are a big part of what they're doing, growing food and providing it to the local community mm-hmm. um, in a sustainable way. So that is such wonderful work. And, and thank you so much for doing it. Oh, absolutely. It was also actually when you just mentioned that it made me think of the intergenerational component because you get all these foods and a lot of people don't necessarily know what to do with them, Mm. but a lot of elders do, you know, so we, we had this older gentleman who was from the South and he knew how to cook so many different things. And we were having like community cooking sessions and stuff. So yeah, so important. Mm. Yes. So beautiful. And I'm sure the food was delicious. So (laughs) So you also worked as the Global Movements Program Director at Why Hunger. Can you tell us about Why Hunger and the work that you were doing there? Sure. Well, I so after a year of working with Just Food, I started at Why Hunger actually on its National Hunger Hotline. Mm. And this was incredibly eye-opening for me because uh, now there are many more decentralized services, but at the time it was a national hotline that people could call from anywhere in the country when they were in need of food and just receiving these calls hearing people's situations Mm. not only hungry people but then we were getting increasing calls from food pantries and food banks that were running out of food Mm. and they were in crisis situation and it just showed the incredible cracks you know um in this incredibly wealthy country that we have Um, with so many people struggling. And then on top of that, we were getting, this was at the time of um, the Iraq and Afghanistan wars um, earlier on, and we were getting lots of calls from military people who had just arrived back and they were going hungry. I mean, Mm. so many layers of of issues. Um, So it was very eye-opening in in that way. I'd say it kind of helped to radicalize me further. But about a year into that work, the person who was doing the international work at Why Hunger was going into semi-retirement and asked if I would take on some of that. And because Why Hunger was mainly doing domestic work around um, food access, it seemed like maybe a niche for our international work could be to help connect, at the time, what was a growing food movement in the U.S., with the global movement for food sovereignty. Because Mm. at the time we weren't really talking much about food sovereignty, but movements all over the world were. Um, And there just seemed to be these natural connections. So inviting food sovereignty leaders uh, to New York City and other cities and having exchanges with food justice leaders. And those connections were just so organic and natural. You know, you don't have to Um, get into terminology or whatever just like the shared struggles and the bonds of solidarity were so strong and obvious Um, so that was essentially the work that I was involved in at Why Hunger which was uh, helping to make some of these linkages between uh, U.S. and other global movements. Mm. And I mean solidarity and networking is so beautiful I just Mm -hmm. wish that it wasn't around such a horrible, horrible thing. You know, it just makes no sense that on this big, beautiful, lush planet that anyone should go hungry. And I mean, I mean, I grew up hungry. Mm. <laughs> so I, I, I know firsthand um, what what that's about and, and what it's mm-hmm. like. And, and especially as a child. And now there are all these debates about whether or not there should be free lunch and whether or not it's just like if it's a debate (laughs) hello are we really having this conversation in 2022 it's Mm -hmm. it's just something um but so i am not going to bring this down (laughs) Mm -hmm. food and justice is made possible with support from defund big meat a grassroots effort to encourage strategic collaboration across all sectors of global justice Find more information about Defund Big Meat at defundbigmeat.org. A Well-Fed World, an international hunger relief and food justice organization advancing plant-based foods and farming to create a nourished and climate-friendly future. Find out more about A Well-Fed World at awfw.org. Better Food Foundation. 
an organization that promotes dietary changes to build a healthy, equitable, humane, and environmentally sustainable food system. You can find out more about Better Food Foundation at betterfoodfoundation.org. And Farm Sanctuary, a farmed animal sanctuary working to fight the disastrous effects of animal agriculture on animals, the environment, social justice, and public health through rescue, education, and advocacy. Find out more about Farm Sanctuary at farmsanctuary.org. You co-founded the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance, first and foremost. And can you tell us about the Alliance's objectives and work? Sure. Uh, well, a few years into that work with Why Hunger, there was the food price crisis of 2007 mm. and 2008, not unlike what we're seeing today. Right Actually, now. The, exactly. The mm -hmm. food price crisis that we're seeing today is the third one in the past 15 years. And of mm. course, we have a food system that's permanently in crisis. And these food fluctuations are just one manifestation of that. Um, so yes, this was 2007, 2008. The food prices start spiraling and all of these corporate actors and philanthrocapitalists start forming all these new alliances. There's the Alliance for a Green Revolution for Africa. There's, I mean, we could just go on and on. So many of these alliances were forming. And for progressive movements in the U.S., we were far less coordinated and organized. And so a number of us were scrambling, just saying, how can we link up together and at least do our part to try to counter some of this um, corporate, you know, consolidation in the face of the food crisis. So a number of organizations created the U.S. Working Group on the Food Crisis as kind of an ad hoc effort and held an emergency meeting in Washington, D.C. And some important work came out of that, but it was very NGO focused, you know, mm -hmm. and actual Im people impacted by the food crisis in the U.S. Um, urban communities of color, small-scale farmers, food workers, indigenous communities, they weren't part of this. And so it just felt like, okay, if we're going to do something serious, not only do they have to be part of it, but really this should be centered on those who are most impacted and on the front lines. So there was this effort at really broadening. Um, and during this time, by 2010, there was the U.S. Social Forum in Detroit, which was a really important space to have some of these conversations and bringing in questions of equity, of race, of class, um, all, all sorts of discussions. And so through those conversations, the framework was laid or the groundwork was laid for the US Food Sovereignty Alliance, which was founded then that fall. It was October of 2010 um, at a food movement gathering in New Orleans. And the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance, actually similar to what we were trying to do on a smaller scale at Why Hunger, but much more. A, it was about trying to build more of a cohesive, united movement around food sovereignty in the U.S. Um, and then B, it was trying to make sure that that movement was linked up and articulated with the growing global movement for food sovereignty. Mm. So that's, um, and then there's a lot more specific work tied to that. There have been working groups focused on land and water grabbing, um, on immigrant rights issues. Um, the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance has, has gone on to do a lot of different work. Um, but yeah, that's kind of it in a nutshell. Wonderful work. And uh, I just want to know how I can get in on being invited to some of these conferences and whatnot. So <laughs> absolutely, I feel like I Let's need talk. to be there. <laughs> <laughs> be. Right. It, so also, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of also, um, you helped to create the Food Sovereignty Prize, which I'm very interested to learn more about. Can you tell us about this award and maybe even some of the remarkable people who have received it? Sure. Uh, there's a bit of a backstory to this uh, because there used to be this annual gathering of the food, of food movements in the U.S. through the Community Food Security Coalition, it was called. This was like an early formation of sort of community-based food work. Um, and it had this annual conference that many folks around the country would come to. In one year, it was 2009, the conference was going to be in Des Moines, Iowa, which mm. is the same location where 
what's called the World Food Prize is held every year. And it was going to be at the same time. And the thing about the World Food Prize is that it was created by who's called the father of the Green Revolution, Norman Borlaug. And the Green Revolution, for listeners who don't know, is, you know, um, it was a U.S. Cold War strategy to bring these technological packets to farmers all over the world based on pesticides, mm. synthetic fertilizers, chemical intensive farming, you know, fostering dependency. This was supposedly uh, trying to also a means of fighting communism and whatnot. Um, anyway, this is the, the guy <laughs> who uh, was sort of considered the father of the Green Revolution, mm -hmm. and he created this World Food Prize. So folks felt that um, we couldn't just be there in Des Moines at the same time this was happening and have no response. So someone had the idea of why don't we have, you know, a sort of people's food prize, and then that turned into the food sovereignty prize. Mm -hmm. And um, so 2009 was the first year uh, that it was held, and the global peasant movement, La Via Campesina, was recognized as having coined mm -hmm. the term. Um, but so many other groups, both domestically and internationally, have been recognized. Um, the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network is one of the domestic groups, uh, uh, the fisheries group, Northwest Atlantic Marine Alliance, um, uh, community, community development, the farm worker group, and then internationally groups uh, in, in Haiti, in Brazil, um, uh, so many different places have, have been recognized with this prize. Um, and the key is that it, it goes to movements, whereas the World Food Prize is really recognizing individuals. Mm. The Food Sovereignty Prize recognizes collective work. And the other thing is that some of the individuals who receive the World Food Prize are doing important work. It's more the prize itself. And it's grounded in this idea, this focus on production, that we can produce our way out of hunger when there's already more than enough food in the world to feed Absolutely. everybody. And it's a question of power. And so the World Food Prize really obscures that. And that's the message that we try to bring. And I should add that when the Community Food Security Coalition ended, I think it was around 2011, the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance stepped in to um, move this prize forward. So now the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance uh, coordinates the prize every year. Wow. I love that story. I love that. That that sounds like a superhero origin story, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> and I think it's exactly that. Um, so, seeds. <laughs> um, there, there's a, starting to be a little bit more talk about seed saving, um, but I still don't think that enough people understand the importance of saving seeds. Why is seed saving such an important part of the fight for food sovereignty? And then I'm going to have a follow-up question about why GMO seeds and seed patents are a threat to food sovereignty. Yeah. Um, well, many of our farmer friends say it starts with seeds, you know, seeds, land, water. These are the essentials of life. Um, and corporations have been commodifying these and making it harder for people to carry out these life-sustaining practices of growing and trading food, of saving seeds. In some cases, even criminalizing these activities. We were hearing from a leader of Kenya Peasants League um, that their new seed law in Kenya is, or it's either a new law or they're trying to impose this law from the outside, of course, mm. um, to criminalize, you know, uh, trading and saving of farmer seed varieties. These are wow. varieties, you know, saved over generations, but um, the corporations are just so greedy and, you know, the institutes and uh, foundations like the Gates Foundation are, are just trying to push forward, again, this continuation of the same idea of the green revolution of just using um, you know, hybrid or GMO seeds that are coming from corporations. And of course, it's not just the seeds, but a whole package that goes with the seeds in order for them to even function. And the mm. fact is, this is a key thing. 
there's this argument of, well, GMOs can produce more, but they don't. And more and more that's being documented. There's this mm. report from years ago now called Failure to Yield that was document just documenting just all of the failures of GMO seeds. And a lot more research has come out since then. Whereas there's a thriving movement for agroecology being led by movements all over the world. And they are increasingly backed by science saying that actually seeds developed in the fields over generations adapted to local conditions, um, especially in the face of climate change are so much more resilient, are able to produce more and to do so without needing all the chemical inputs that are destroying the environment at the same time. Um, so I, I feel like I've gone on a bit of a tangent, but basically whenever you talk to probably any farmer anywhere, they'll talk about the importance of seeds. And I think going back to the question of GMOs, um, yeah, there's an, another thing is all you have to do is look at what kind of crops are actually being focused on by the corporations that are coming up with the GMOs. These are not the crops for the most part that are actually nourishing people. Mm. These are the crops that are just feeding into the industrial system. Um, industrial corn, soy, et cetera. So um, yeah, the thing about GMOs supposedly being to feed the world, um, there are just so many facts that actually run counter to that while showing um, the extreme importance of seeds produced in the fields and saved and exchanged by communities. Oh. Thank you so much for making those points. I I come across so many people who talk about um, any criticism to GMO seeds as just not based in science, as hysteria, as, as all these things. And it's just really good to, to hear somebody who knows what they're talking about <laughs> just state these facts. Because, I mean, folks are getting caught up in, in this pro-GMO uh, mm -hmm. stuff. And, and, and it's just, um, there needs to be some kind of counter to that. Yes. So, because it's because there's so much power behind those narratives. Yeah. I, mean, I don't even, I can't even imagine how many millions or billions of dollars are being poured into maintaining these narratives. Yeah. I mean, we yeah. can imagine. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so some people understand how food scarcity is a systemic issue, but water scarcity is often seen as more of like a natural phenomenon or a natural problem, a result of droughts or even an, inf an issue of infrastructure and bad policy like in Flint. But can you speak to why access to water is an issue? of global inequality with over 1 billion people lacking adequate water access? Yes, I mean, I, I think you've, you've just touched upon it. Um, I think if we pull back the layers, right, all of these examples, droughts, infrastructure policy, they all have to do with um, equity because even so-called natural disasters like droughts and flooding, why is it that some people are so much more impacted than others? Right? It's because they've already been forced to live a precarious existence. Mm. So when something like a drought or flood happens, that pushes them over the edge um, into extreme hunger or into you know, losing their home, their, their farmland, etc. Mm. Um, so I think if people are already starting to make connections on food being a systemic issue, I mean, water is so linked. Industrial agriculture that we've been talking about that Green Revolution model is a massive user of water, massive amounts of water to feed industrial crop production, um, industrial livestock production. And not only does it use water, but then it pollutes it. And this mm. water, you know, goes back into um, community water systems and, and into our rivers and other water sources, our groundwater. Um, and then also things like land grabs are also water grabs because there's the, the water both under the ground 
um, and the bodies of water. And then also when you're grabbing land um, all, along the coast, you're also grabbing access to that water. Um, hydropower and other large corporate mega projects are displacing, you know, building huge dams, cutting off community water sources. And then, of course, privatization of water, including the practices of bottled water and beverage companies like Coke and Nestle that are just um, ravaging communities to be able to make a profit. Um, these and so many other issues, I would say, are part of what makes uh, water, like food, definitely um, an, an equity issue. Mm. I am... Um... You just reminded me of a family. I met a family and and uh, down in North Carolina, uh, who I was talking to about the fact that they live in close proximity to um, a hog farm, mm -hmm. and um, <clears throat> how their well water got contaminated, and so they didn't have access. You know, this is like feces, mm -hmm. like pig feces mm -hmm. in their well water. Um, and it was also being sprayed onto the fields around the facility, but their wind exists. And so mm -hmm. this raw feces mm -hmm. was just being like sprayed and then carried on the wind into this community. Of course, it was a low income mm -hmm. black community and um, and how like the, the impact mm -hmm. of, of this facility on just their everyday lives. And it was yeah. it was really heartbreaking. So, yeah, I, I definitely can uh, concur with what you're saying about the, this water crisis. The Food and Justice Podcast is proud to be organizational partners with Afro-Vegan Society, Food Empowerment Project, Grow Where You Are, and Vine Sanctuary. Um, so you currently work as the communications director for Grassroots International. Can you tell us about Grassroots International's mission and about the work that you're currently doing there? Sure. Well, Grassroots International is a great organization. I'm really um, honored to have linked up with them. Um, back when I was doing the food organizing work in New York City, I worked with folks from Grassroots International and really admired their work because they were often taking stances uh, much bolder than a lot of the other um, NGOs that I was connected to. Mm -hmm. um, it's a movement support organization that's been around for nearly 40 years, and it works with many of the movements we've been talking about um, with La Via Campesina, um, World March of Women, and other transnational social movements that are promoting food sovereignty, and also national and local movements as well um, in Haiti, throughout parts of Latin America, um, in Palestine, West Africa, other parts of, of the world. Uh, and increasingly making links uh, in, in the U.S. as well, and was also a founding organization of the U.S. Food Sovereignty Alliance. Um, and so grassroots, it, it is within the philanthropy community. Um, it provides funds to social movements, but it's much more than funds. It's also political accompaniment based mm -hmm. on long-term relationship building, based on trust, based on asking hard questions, and it, it uses what it calls, in contrast to the philanthro-capitalist kind of model that's so pervasive, uh, what they call solidarity philanthropy. Um, and yes, as I said, this involves those, you know, long-term relationships of political accompaniment with social movements, but also working to um, challenge, and in certain ways you could say decolonize the philanthropy sector, because Philanthropy is historically is connected to so many of the problems that we've been talking about. Um, so trying to sort of confront some of these contradictions head on and work with other progressive funders um, for a shift that, that really centers uh, the leadership of social movements who are, you know, key to, um, you know, helping to get us out of the messes that, that we're in these days. Um, 
my work is about trying to, you know, capture some of the stories coming from the front lines, from our movement partners that are so important, so inspiring, mm. their stories, but also the frameworks that they're offering up about you know, like food sovereignty, agroecology, grassroots, feminist economies for life, um, all, all sorts of really important work coming from the front lines. Um, and also, yeah, ch trying to challenge and reshape some of the narratives that we've been talking about, you know, like about production versus power and all of those things. So that's some of the work that I'm doing with, with grassroots with some really fantastic colleagues um, and some amazing uh, movement folks and, and progressive funder folks uh, and, and others. Wow, that is great work. I actually did not know about the the aspect of of, um, of challenging just the philanthropic system part. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is remarkable because it is definitely built on like a colonization model. I mean, I, like I, I <laughs> funny story. Um, not not ha ha funny, but. Mm -hmm. Grr, funny. Um, it is that there uh, is a philanthropic organization in Baltimore um, that that really um, they kind of push this idea that they are trying to solve problems, you know, mm. in in marginalized mm -hmm. communities in Baltimore. But they end up what they end up doing is just this, like what they end up funding is just the same stuff that it just gets recycled over and over and over again. And so most recently during the time that I've been doing my work, um, they just gave all this money away to these white people <laughs> to come in and start community gardens. No. Oh, no. yes. Oh, yes. So much money. And so these people who like have never even stepped foot into the hood before um, and and quite frankly, didn't seem terribly comfortable being there, um, would just come in and they would, we have a lot of vacant lots here in Baltimore. And so mm -hmm. they would just come in and, and take over this lot and they would bring like all these volunteers in to, um, you know, to build these community gardens, these raised beds. One, they didn't ask anybody in the community what they wanted. They didn't invite anybody from the community to be a part of these projects. And they didn't, they would put up gates around the gardens and lock them. Wow. One person in particular hired a, uh, a young boy from the community, he was 16 years old, to stand watch outside the garden with his oh pit bull God. to make sure that people from the community didn't get into the garden to take the food, right? And it's just like, these are the kinds of projects that are being funded by the philanthropic community in Baltimore to, to so-called solve the, the problems wow. in the community. That's and it, a really oh, painful yeah. and powerful example. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and she would um, pay him by buying him McDonald's food. <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah, that was, that was, yeah. Wow. So that's what, that's what we're dealing mm -hmm. with here. Mm -hmm. So moving on from that. So thank you for that work that you're doing because my goodness, there is so much that needs to be addressed with philanthropy. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to talk about globalization. I'm going to be honest. I only like, I don't know, have a vague understanding <laughs> of globalization. Um, and I'm not ashamed to say that. Uh, I'm a little ashamed to say that. But uh, I want to, I, I would love to hear you talk about what globalization is and how it threatens resource rights and drives hunger. And I know that there's a connection between the two, but I would love to hear you to talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. And I, I think you do know a whole lot about this because this is a lot, you know, what you've been talking about. I mean, globalization is one way to frame it, but it's essentially, you know, this process uh, over the past decades, especially where more and more power has been ceded by governments and handed over to corporations where mm. the amount of corporate domination over our food system and many other aspects of life has just grown to alarming proportions. So take the food system. Um, there, it's estimated that four corporations control 60% of the commercially traded seed in the world, you know? Um, and I, I, I recently read an estimate that 
four corporations control 90% of the global grain trade. What? So, you know, who is benefiting from these skyrocketing food prices that we're seeing right now, for instance. And then it's not only the grain traders, like the cargo, Bungie, ADM and stuff, but there's a whole host of newer actors in the financial sector that are also getting in on the deal and actually speculating on food prices, essentially gambling on hunger. And oh, this should no. be an illegal criminal activity, but thanks to decades of deregulation of, you know, the laws that should be protecting against this, this is just rampant. And it, they're not just speculating on food prices, but increasingly also on land, um, because after, you know, the, the housing bubble um, of about 15 years ago, financial firms started looking for other forms of investment and found that farmland was a relatively um, secure and kind of good form of investment. So started buying up farmland all over the world. And so we have uh, TIAA, which is a pension fund, is actually the world's largest investor and in management of farmland. So these are folks who have no, you know, actual interest in, um, you know, supporting communities, yeah. feeding people, et cetera, but they're buying up resources. For instance, TIAA, even though it should be illegal because it's a U.S.-based corporation, but is uh, buying up vast tracts of land in Brazil by creating these Brazilian subsidiaries to make it supposedly oh. ostensibly legal um, in one of the world's most biodiverse regions, you know? Um, so I, I would say all of this ties into the question about, you know, how is globalization impacting resource rights? Because um, yeah, this global rush on farmland that's happening all over the world, uh, um, yeah, across, yeah, all basically all continents, um, especially Africa um, mm -hmm. and, together with the land grabs or the water grabs as, as we were talking about. Um, so yeah, we have land, water, resource grabs. We have uh, the food prices spiraling out of control and we can point to particular incidences like you know the conflict in Ukraine, et cetera, but this is a fundamentally um, flawed and intentionally flawed system um, to essentially just feed into corporate profits it's been built this way by design and you know what some might call globalization um this just this process of handing over power to corporations um, has been facilitating it and part of the issue is that these corporations have no accountability to the populations being impacted, mm. unlike governments, which at least with all their flaws and problems, at least in theory, there's you know, some connection to the citizens um, and some possibilities of, you know, through public policy and um, you know, working to pressure uh, elected officials, et cetera, et cetera. But with corporations, you know, these are just uh, basically unregulated bodies that can do pretty much whatever they want. And still, thankfully, social movements are finding ways. They're, they're tracing the money trails. They're um, making these links between what might be happening in a community in Brazil and you know, people sitting in a um, conference room somewhere in the US. Um, they're doing this incredible work. And then also um, protesting, putting, putting their bodies on the line, doing uh, all sorts of ways uh, trying to resist this. And this is why movements like the food sovereignty movement and many others are, are so important because they're directly confronting these practices and these powerful actors at the same time that they're working to build alternatives, you know, to, to sustain life. Um, so yeah, I guess in, that's how I would respond to that question. Well, I mean, I I was uh, starting to get a little down, and and I thought, well, we we're reaching the end of our conversation. Maybe I should wrap things up by asking you what you feel hopeful about. But you just were one mm -hmm. step ahead of me, <laughs> and and I like you just brought me back up, and I I really appreciate that. But I, I do want to ask you, like, are there things that make you 
other than you know what you've already talked about with with folks who are working on these issues that just make you feel hopeful and optimistic i, I really hope you feel hopeful and optimistic <laughs> <laughs> and if you do um is there anything in particular that gives you that yeah i mean i think it is what we've been the movements we've been talking about really um because as as we started off in our informal chat earlier like yeah this is just such a time of so many converging crises upon crises upon crises that the world is facing on so many levels but the fact that yeah people are coming together they're strategizing they're organizing they're building alliances they're working across divides and trying to bridge those divides creating powerful movements shifting narratives mm. you know actually having you know making impacts uh, we have we see examples of food sovereignty adopted into policy from the local to the national to the global levels um, and this is all thanks to an incredible amount of organizing and strategizing, working both inside the system and outside the system at the same time in really dynamic, strategic ways. Um, yes, and, and at the same time, just the flourishing of agroecology across the world. And what we saw during the pandemic when so many of these system failures, again, failures by design, became so evident when um, you know, food, uh, like ports were shut down and supermarkets were shut down and how were people eating? It, it goes back to the example you gave earlier of, of the woman in the community you work in. It's these, uh, you know, these informal networks and channels of people saving seeds, trading seeds, growing food, feeding each other, um, doing all this kind of care work um, that is really essential to life. And at the same time, they're, they're not just doing this work, but they're analyzing it and they're creating frameworks around it. Um, so yeah, that all gives me hope. And you, you said aside from that, I would say the only other thing aside from that is my daughter. <laughs> she oh. gives me a lot of hope. And um, I would say, yeah, like the, the, um, the children, because it's, it just kind of reminds us on a daily basis, like every day for me, it pretty much right around five, I, I try to put things down and spend mm. some time with her and just, you know, seeing the world through her eyes and, and the inherent connection to nature, even as we're in a city, but the connection to nature that children have. Yes. And she's so fascinated by the moon and she loves soil and dirt and water. And these, I don't think they're really things we've had to teach her. They're just in her, which means that they're in all of us. And I think that that is also um, very hopeful that, that we can, we still have the ability of cutting through all the crap and tapping into this connection to the earth and hence to all of us um, that, that we have and that we can hopefully use to create something better. So those are the things that give me hope. <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing. And and your daughter is so fortunate to have a mom who is just out here working so hard to make the world better. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Dr. Christina Schiavone, for everything that you're doing and for just taking the time. I know you're busy. <laughs> taking the time to be on this show and sharing all your knowledge and wisdom and insight with the viewers. I am so appreciative for your time. Well, thank you. I'm so honored to be here. I've seen you know some of the past folks that you've featured and I'm in incredible company and, oh. and also being on here with you so thank you so much and thanks for the work that you do wow well mm -hmm. thank you all the viewers and and listeners uh for tuning into this show and I know you've learned so much and I know that you now are so motivated to go out and do something so uh Dr. Schiavone's information will be of course listed um on the website and so you know you can uh, connect with her there and we will see you at the next episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in to Food and Justice with Brenda Sanders. See you next time.